of life for a reason. Tomorrow I'm doing a memorial service for John Reyna. And John had asked me a year or so ago to, to do his memorial service, and he said that he wanted a celebration of life. And I have found that in the last few years, fewer and fewer people are doing funerals, and more people are doing celebrations of life. And so... In thinking about it and preparing for the memorial service tomorrow, I thought it would be good for us to kind of touch on how we live life. Because do we live life as a celebration of life, or do we live life like a funeral? (laughs) So that's kind of the question. Because Jesus makes all the difference in this. Now the interesting thing, and what's I've already got a schedule for what he's planning to, you know, the family is planning to do, which, by the way, he he set up, in essence, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And this is going to be unique, in a sense, the celebration of life, because he chose the song, uh, You Can Only Imagine. And interesting enough, at the concert last night, they played that song. And those four guys... Five guys, rather, sang that song, You Could Only Imagine. And I was listening to the words and thinking about John, and I was thinking about the memorial service tomorrow, and I just listened to the words and all the meaning that they had. And then the, the, second, the middle part of it is I'm supposed to do the memorial for him, uh, both I and Dr. Meyer, but he'd asked me, But John, early on, wasn't long after I met him, which was about seven, eight years ago. He made this statement to me, and and I I know that he would not, he's not embarrassed by the statement. He said, you know, I want to die loving my wife. That was, you know, the statement he made. And as I through the three and a half weeks in which he, the process of dying and all of that, he did exactly that. You know, he was available to her. Um, he suffered through things because we thought he was going to die immediately because of the situation. But unlike anything else, again, uh, we, we talked about it, and we discussed life, and we talked about the celebration of life. He talked about some people that he wanted to make sure that were there. And uh, so we, we had that discussion. And then on the, the program for tomorrow, he ends with a song that's Cien años, a hundred years. It's a love song to his wife. You know, I've I've never uh, done a memorial service where a person is loving, you know, in the beginning and encouraging and in the end. And so you see the, the love of God coming through him again toward his wife, toward his family, and all of this in the whole process that he's that the family's gone through, and so you hear, you know, that he was a good husband. I know that he was a good father. He was a good friend. All of those things, which brings me to the scripture, John chapter ten, and verse ten. Here's what Jesus says about himself, and I, it's something that we need when we think about a celebration of life. We need to understand. He says, a thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So 
So when we think about a celebration of life, we have to think and we have to understand that Jesus indeed is the Good Shepherd and Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And able to be able to celebrate life, even in death, that we can celebrate life. And as Jeanette was singing, for God so loved the world, and he suffered, but he, he did it for a reason. He, it was, there's a purpose. It was out of his love. So when we look at Jesus and the difference in our ability to celebrate life because we serve a good shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for us, not only for life right now, but life forever. So, what might life be like today without Jesus? So let's just imagine for a moment that we, we know nothing about Jesus and all the things that Jesus taught us. So we, we have to re remove in our celebration of life and our understanding a resurrection. We have to remove our connection between God and humanity. We have to remove that. Oh, we have to remove forgiveness. We have to do that. We have to remove salvation. Uh, we have to remove reconciliation and redemption. We have to remove the God is love. And we also have to remove that he is our Heavenly Father. Take those things out of your life right now, and what's your life like? Oh, that God is also good, and he wants us to have an abundant life. If we remove these things, life is different. What would we have to celebrate? Because the reality in our world that we all understand, life brings death. Life brings death. If we're just going to die, then life is limited. And for the older we are, the more limited it is. My wife and I are kind of in that transition stage where we're, she keeps telling me we're getting old. And I keep staying in the state of denial in that regard. I, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of hopeful, but I, I realize. And then I look at people that are 20 years older, just 20 years older than me, and they look old. <laughs> and I know that I'm not going to be able to beat that because nobody else has, has beaten that in the past. So with that... If, if life is limited, then life is hopeless. It's, it's futile. It's kind of got to be self-centered because what can I do in the, well, let's say I live 20 more years. What can I do in the 20 years? And I've been here as your pastor for 20 years. Of course, I did have black hair then. You know, it's almost as black as Austin's back then. 20 years. It isn't black today. And the like, and then big bushy black eyebrows. And now they're getting white. You know, they're Velcro. I stick the things in the light. So when we think about God, what He did, and we think about if there is no God, then we miss the, the point of what's t told to us and we, is recorded in God's Word. And this is where we, I wanted to read from the scriptures there that Jesus said, people are searching the scriptures, you know, for, for life and all of that. And yet they, wo they won't come to him to have life. They won't believe in him. So when we read Genesis, though, we know that we understand that God created. He made man and woman. And he made them in his image. And he blessed them and that it was very good. This is what we see. And we, we have to have a belief that indeed it was very good. In fact, when we talk about the perfect condition in which to live, we talk about the Garden of Eden. 
a time when Adam, Eve, there was no sin. Everything was perfect. As wonderful as you could possibly be. But we also realize in our humanity, as we're talking about in our celebration of life, that we can be really negative and say, well, we're just going to die, so what's the use of, of trying? Well, the Apostle Peter addresses that issue in part in 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want us to bear in mind as we go through this that there is a good shepherd. There is a shepherd who leads us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He's a good shepherd who has directed our paths and we can follow and we know that he, he cares for us and that he loves us. But in 1 Peter chapter 1 in verses 3 through 6, we'll take a look at here because he, he, the Apostle Peter, addresses the tension between life and death. He says here, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Not just a little bit, I'm reminded of other scriptures as well. But this has to do in part for us to understand a celebration of life today. I'm talking about this very moment, a celebration of life. To celebrate what God has done and what God is doing in our life. And so that celebration that we have is filled with grace and it is filled with peace. No matter what the situation, because we know that we have a God who is sovereign. But not only is God sovereign, but God also is a loving God. So our grace and peace is not just a little bit, it's in abundance. The result then, verse 3, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we think about celebrating life, it is about praise to God. As we were traveling towards Modesto last evening, and we're looking at the green hills of, green hills of California, and we're you know, seeing creeks and rivers filled with water, and you, you're thinking, Oh, wow, this is gorgeous. And we're seeing, you know, wildflowers blossom and seeing cattle on the hills and sheep and all of those things. And we're, we're talking about the good things of God and just enjoying conversation with one another. We raise, and, and then to hear other people. This is important for us. It's like going to the concert is when you hear other people praise God because sometimes we can feel awful isolated feel like we're the only ones. We can feel like Elijah. I'm just the only one. But there are other people out there who are praising God and, and filled with praise. And they sing songs to praise. They cannot help themselves. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now here's the tension. He has given us a new hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Hope and dead. That's the tension that we find Peter is addressing here. And, and when we look at that, so when we think about that, we ask ourselves, what if this life is all that there is? So we've got to kind of look at that on the one hand to con contrast it. What if beyond this life there is no family? No friends. No loved ones. Beyond the moment of death. What if that is the situation? That's on the one hand, that's a negative. On the other hand, what if, because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, there's a celebration of life, an incredible celebration of life that all alive. And there's a party, a wedding feast, and there's healing and health and life and food and fellowship and 
eternity stretches out like you've never seen it before and understand it. So what if there's something beyond that? So let me give you an example, and this kind of jumped out into my mind yesterday as I was preparing the sermon. Since I've I've run a lot of races, and I watch a lot, a lot of races, but we can do anything, and we're going to use it in the term of races. What if you're running a race? Let's call it a marathon, a 400 meter, a mile, 100 yard dash, because some races are shorter than others. And everything. So imagine, for example, let's use the mile. You're running a mile. And at the finish line of the mile, everything is done. Once you cross that finish line, it's over. There's no victory, celebration. There's no cheering. There's no congratulations. There's nobody to celebrate with. It's just over. Imagine that. And you've got to ask yourself, why am I running? Why am I running? You say, well, oh, well, you're, you're running for the glory. Well, not everybody is going to finish first. And yet, people run. So if there's no victory party, it ends once you get to the finish line. It just kind of helps us maybe think in a little different way. It's all over. It's done. Finished. You hit the tape. The lights go out. That's it. But you see, what we understand is with God, we run the race. And as the Apostle Paul says, I've run the race, and I know that there's a crown of life laid up for me. Is he running it for the, ra- for, for the crown? No, he's not running it just for the crown. He's running it because this is the race that God has laid out before him. This is the challenge. This is the life. And every lap. Every lap, and this is part of the celebration of life, you hear him cheering, cheering you on. You can do it. With my help, you can do it. It's possible. And it is, it is so awesome when you finish this race. So life, death, and a new beginning changes everything. Jesus, as the good shepherd, has made it possible. He is there cheering at the finish line and starting a whole new chapter. Because what oftentimes happens when a person finishes and they they finish their one, their race and let's say they have one, what what has happened to like a lot of Olympic medalists? After they've won, there's a lot of endorsements. There's, life goes on. There's, there's other things. It's, it's, life is good. Life is good for Michael Phelps. He's won a lot of gold medals in the life. Life is very good. But imagine that with God, the one who's, who's putting the crown on your head is saying to you, well done. Well done, sister. That's the one. Jesus is celebrating with you. Celebrating with us. So when you think about that, and God cheering us on, and Peter begins with, and he starts with how how good the Father and Jesus are. And then he talks about they, they celebrate his abundant mercy. And we, we think about, we tell the story, I, I didn't think I could ever do it. I didn't think it was possible. And then he kind of says, well, let me tell you 
you know, here, here's some of these stories. Here, let's, let's meet these people from Hebrews 11. And some you know, some you don't. But let me introduce you and tell you their story and how inspiring and how encouraging that is. So we're begotten again, it tells us here in First Peter, to a lively hope. Yes, because Jesus is so good, because we have redemption, because we have forgiveness, because we have a, a brother who died for us, who lived, we have a high priest that, that is so gracious and loving and kind and invites us to come into his presence in our time of need. We celebrate life. Even when we fall and we get up again, we celebrate life. Because who gave us life? We have to ask ourselves, who gave us life? God gave us life. And from the beginning of the foundation of the world, this is the celebration. And this is the relationship that God wants to have. So we have a, a lively hope. And what's to happen? Verse 4. We celebrate an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Now, what's the inheritance? Somebody I, close to where my son lives back in Indiana won this past week $435 million. One person. That's a pretty good inheritance, you know. You would think, oh, I could do a lot of things with that. But what we inherit, brethren when we look at it, is eternal life. But it isn't just life. I'll go back to John. John Rayner. John was this guy who just loved his wife. He loved being in love with his wife. Jesus loves to love us. I mean, that's just who he is. When we think about life, how long, how long is Jesus going to love us? Is he ever going to fall out of love with us? No. And what it might be to know the love of God? You see, in death, we see things, positive things about people that we never saw before when they died. All the, many of the bad things that we, we saw in them, when they're not there, you say, oh, he or she, they, they did that. Oh, that laugh. It's, it's gone. It's not there. And how, how I loved that laugh. And what I loved about this I just, I just see, and of course, I'm, I'm conjuring this up in my own mind, and like it's, as it were, from the grave. John is telling his wife how much he loved her, and that's going to last the rest of her life. Well, Jesus from the grave told us how much he loved us, and that lasts for all eternity. So you see, life is not life. You can have $435 million, but if you, have no, if you have not love, you have nothing. And that comes from an old nerd, the Apostle Paul. I mean, Paul doesn't impress me as Mr. Feelings kind of guy. He does not impress me at all when I read who he was and, you know, his bottom line and all that. But the Apostle Paul just says to him, look, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. And Paul was celebrating life because he had a whole new lease on life. He, he understood there was something beyond the grave. So, and you think, well, I've lost everything. Well, Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, he says that we have eternal life and because that was their concern. What are we going to get and all that? And Jesus said, if you've lost father, mother, and all that, you get a hundredfold back. And then he tells us, we'll inherit the promises in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. The promises of God. Now, we sing a song entitled, Standing on the Promises of God. We have no idea 
how awesome and how wonderful the promises of God really are. And then Revelation 21 verse 7 tells us we inherit all things. So there's a lot of things out there. All things. We inherit them. And who's made it possible? Jesus has made it possible. So I want to read about very briefly here how he has made it possible which allows us to celebrate life in this very moment in this very day that we have in Hebrews chapter 2 and we'll begin here in verse 9 where he tells us here but we see Jesus who's made a little lower than the angels now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone not just some, but for everyone. That's you and me. But we see a difference. Jesus died, but now we see him crowned with glory. And, and by the way, and also our hope is what? That we also will be crowned with glory. That the mortal will become immortal. And he goes on in bringing many sons to glory. It is fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. It is the way God is doing things. Jeanette was sharing with me in one of her papers a statement was made that we live in a flawed creation. I don't believe it's a flawed creation. I believe God knew exactly what he's doing. He has a plan, and he's, he's got an incredible creation we have to deal with with what God has given to us because he's done it all out of his good but he's bringing many sons to glory both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family and we, we think about a celebration of life and it's easy enough for us to think well in the resurrection I'll get to see grandma and grandpa and my childhood died early, I'll get to see family. But brethren, when we begin to think a little broader that we see the whole family of God and that they and that they are family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. What a celebration of life. When it's like when we get together with other Christians. They're not attending our denomination. We get to other Christians and they're talking about their love for God, love for Christ and all of that. It's a celebration. It's an, enjoy, an enjoyment. But the hope that we have for the future, because we have a living hope. So we, we see this in Christ Jesus. And, and notice here, they're holy, they're the same family, and here's what it says of Jesus. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. So, you can only imagine. You can only imagine the moment that Jesus and John meet. Eye to eye. You can only imagine. And he says, I am not ashamed to call you brother. Oh, also brethren, in this life, we celebrate. Who's the firstborn of many brethren? Who's the one that calls us brothers? Who's the one that dwells in our heart, directs our life? Directs our life? We have cause for celebrating life today. Oh yes, we're human. We make mistakes, and we are flawed. We are flawed. We have flaws. <laughs> We've created our own flaws through our own choices and like. But it is our loving brother who has done that. And notice his care. Verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. All the things, a celebration of life where we are children, he shared in our humanity, and to free 
those who all of their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. We are not held in slavery. When we think about celebrating life, as Paul said, whether I live or whether I die, he had a hope in God. So life celebration are greatest when it's shared with loved ones, friends, family, and Jesus. Because Jesus is the difference in all of this. John would not be my brother if it weren't for Jesus. But because of Jesus, he is. And because Jesus loves him so much, you can't help but love him as well. So Jesus gives us cause to celebrate. And what does Jesus say of the disciples in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 16? And just kind of quickly going through that. We are love disciples. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And you are my friends. And I have chosen you. We tend to think that we're the best caretakers of everybody throughout all eternity, and we're not. The reality is, those who die in Christ are in God's hands. That's why when we think about Paul again in the the book of Ephesians, to comprehend the love of God, how wide, how deep, how high, to comprehend it. And that statement is made by a man who considered himself the chief sinner of all time. And the chiefest of sinners. But let's look at what he celebrated in Christ. In the book of Galatians, chapter 2 and verse 20, and I, I know Mac and I talked about this oftentimes, and it was one of his favorite scriptures, and certainly is mine as well. But in Galatians chapter 2, here's what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. It is Jesus who lives his life through us. Now, in short term, and in kind of wrapping this up, in John chapter 11, this is the example of Jesus, a common family, loved of God, facing death. And of course, that common family we're talking about is Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And Lazarus was near death. Jesus is there. He makes all the difference. And Jesus says, you know, and they're doubting and all that. I am the resurrection and life. And he also says, Lazarus is my friend and my brother. And he says, now this is happening that you'll see the glory of God. Life and death in one day. In one day. Lazarus is dead, and in one day, he's alive. And what happens? In that day, when Lazarus comes forth out of the grave, they are celebrating the life of Lazarus, that he lives again. Now, our future is this, and I hope that we understand it. It's like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all people most miserable. But we do not. We, we do have hope in Christ. We have hope in the forgiveness, the love, the mercy, the kindness, the compassion, all of those things that Jesus has for us. But we also look forward and we celebrate the fact that there is a resurrection. We have a lively hope. And that those old wrinkles, those old bodies, the, those... The dying process is part of the whole process and that there is a resurrection from mortality to immortality, from earthly 
to heavenly, from inglorious to glory. We celebrate both life and death and understanding that God has a purpose. And we appreciate it, and we can celebrate life because we have a good shepherd. Incredibly good shepherd in this life and in the life to come. We have hope. We have a lively hope. So my hope for all of us, as we look around our life and say, who am I? In and of ourselves, we're nobody. But in Jesus' eyes, we're holy and blameless. His brethren, who he's working with, he's the author, the finisher of our faith, and we are highly loved by him. He gave his life for us. And so we celebrate life today. And I remind us that there's a future celebration that's going to put all celebrations, as it were, that humanity has known to shame. It's a celebration of life. That God is fulfilling his purpose. God, we are in God's care. And that we serve a good shepherd who laid down his life for his friends. And he will take care of them because the same spirit that raised up Jesus will also raise us up as well. Celebrate life. He has come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you very much for your blessings. Thank you for everyone here. Thank you for our lives, Father. And we, th- we thank you for Mari, that you've watched over his life. And uh, so however it turns out, Lord, we know that you're a good God. So help us to celebrate life, you, who you are. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, a hope of an incredible and wonderful relationship now and forever. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Feeling the blues today or tired of life already? Do you have questions about life or need spiritual advice? The Worldwide Church of God is located in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto, California. We welcome everyone to attend our worship services with us every week at the times listed on your screen.